Hey, honey. Yes, Barry? Let's get out of here. Where are we going? Where do we always go? Hasta encuentra la playa Por eso grito al mundo Yo soy de Puerto Vallarta Samba de Puerto Vallarta Noche de arrullo en el mar Samba de Puerto Vallarta Hello fellow travelers and welcome to this episode of the Puerto Vallarta Travel Show. I'm your host, Barry Kessler, and I am just so happy to be introducing you to my favorite vacation destination. Maybe it's even yours, and that's Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. That music you're listening to is performed by Alberto Perez, and Alberto is the owner of the Lapa Lapa Group of Restaurants. Those are the Lapa Lapa, Puerto Vallarta's oldest restaurant, and the famous Los Muertos Beach and the El Dorado Restaurant Beach Club right next door. So you can enjoy that fantastic view of the Los Muertos Pier, all lit up at night in beautiful colors, or during the day in its grand splendor for breakfast, lunch, or dinner, seated with your toes in the sand right at the water's edge. It's so romantic. It's so Puerto Vallarta, my friends. This week we are going to the village of Yalapa in Cabo Corrientes, just south of Puerto Vallarta, and we're going to be talking with a very interesting man from my neck of the woods, Hollywood, California. (laughs) His name is Tomas, and Tomas has lived in Yalapa for many years, and one of the things he's known for is salt. Uh, Tomas is the salt guy, but uh, he's got some great stories to tell about his adopted home, Yalapa, and out-of-this-world kind of stories, uh, if you know what I mean. We'll hear about that soon. We'll also be visiting with uh, the Vallarta Botanical Garden and Bob Price, the guy who's in charge down there. Uh, he's going to get us all up to date on what's happening at the garden and what we should be looking for. But before we get to Bob and Tomas, let's see what's happening this week of the 25th of December, 2021. Merry Christmas, everybody. That is, if you celebrate that kind of thing. Uh, It is beginning to look a lot like Christmas in Puerto Vallarta. Uh, Right along the Malacan, the ice rink is busy. Uh, They've got that carousel. They've got a train that goes up and down the Malacan with with the little passengers. Uh, They have little posadas, little processions that go along the Malacan. Uh, And, of course, the, the Christmas village... Uh, which is bright and very festive. We talked about that last week. Seems they finally figured out what to do with those little huts, those little the houses, the structures in the Christmas village uh, that they built along the Malacan. They started building their, their uh, located just where McDonald's is, and then they go all the way down to where the ice rink is. Um, the businesses along the Malacan actually are individually sponsoring the stands, and uh, thus they are paying for the opportunity uh, to do so. And, uh, of course, that will help offset the cost of the project. Uh, of course, the project is a little bit pricey. It's uh, about 8 million pesos, or about $400,000 U.S., a figure that caused many people uh, to actually wonder where on earth that money was going to be coming from, uh, while the city, of course, is struggling to pay their employees. Uh, I have some clips of uh, of the happenings uh, along the Malacan. I'll have them in the show notes. They were recorded by my friend, my on-the-ground reporter, uh, Salvador Estrada, the candy man on the Malacan in his wheelchair with his new phone. And uh, when you do see Salvador, by the way, uh, throw him a couple of extra pesos. He, he had to buy a new van. Uh, the engine on his old one was shot. Uh, his old one was basically just melting uh, to the ground. I've got some pictures uh, that I'll share with you of his old van, and I'll tell you a little story next week about that van and uh, and some of the experiences that I've had with Salvador, um, having helped him set up in the morning and break down and uh, get back to his van in the evening. Uh, it's a whole different perspective on being wheelchair-bound in Puerto Vallarta, or anywhere for that matter, and I'll, I'll be sharing that with you next week. 
Uh, now, speaking of uh, a city having no money to pay its employees, have you noticed prices going up in your neck of the woods, wherever you happen to live? Well, it's happening in Mexico, too. Uh, from Puerto Vallarta Reporter Online, inflation, inflation and price hikes, a huge concern as the year ends. Even with inflation this year expected to be close to 8%, economists are warning that beginning of year price hikes in goods and services are coming, often referred to as Cuesta de Enero. Uh, they will hit pocketbooks hard and likely to drag on through the first five months of the year. Universidad de Guadalajara researcher Victor Ivan del Toro predicted that the price of a tortilla uh, could increase 24 pesos a kilo. Uh, while other products whose prices have spiraled recently, including tomatoes and beef, will continue to rise. Even with a hike in the minimum wage, low-paid workers will be a long way off being able to afford the monthly canasta basica, or the uh, basic basket of 121 staple items that totals just over 11,000 pesos, he said. Uh, the current minimum wage is 4,200 pesos a month. Uh, meanwhile, President Manuel López Obrador has accused unscrupulous businesses in Mexico of taking advantage of current economic climate to hit consumers with price hikes that are far in excess of the inflation rate. Uh, if inflation is 6 or 7%, they are increasing products by 15 or 20%, he complained at a recent press conference. Inflation in November reached 7.37% annually. Its highest level in more than two decades, which has caused Banixco to uh, raise interest rate for the fifth consecutive time to 5.5%. While AMLO said the government was taking great care of inflation, he noted that it is a temporary and worldwide phenomenon. He boasted that his administration has managed to maintain stability of Mexico's currency, which he said had depreciated by just 2.8% against the U.S. dollar in three years since he took office, compared to 57.39% during the six years of his predecessor, Enrique Peña Nieto. And I have a link to that particular article from uh, Puerto Vallarta Reporter uh, in the show notes. Uh, now, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about changes to the FMM, the tourist card. We talked about the crackdown on those... Uh, people who touch base every six months at their countries of origin, and then those people turn around and they spend another six months in Mexico. Essentially, uh, they're making Mexico their home without going through the process of actually qualifying for and applying for temporary residency or permanent residency as is required by Mexican law. And if you missed that episode, you can listen to or you can read about it uh, in the show notes uh that was two weeks ago, approximately, we uh, were over at Puerto Magico. Uh, well, there's new rules uh, that we now must follow as tourists that aren't really new rules at all, just that they were never enforced to the letter, but now uh, they are, and that is that we must now, as tourists, carry our passports and our FMM, our tourist cards, with us at all times, it seems. Um uh, and if, if you uh, are a resident or if you are a permanent resident or a temporary resident and you have that, that green card, you must carry that card at all times as well. Now, before, uh, I always suggested that you, you make black and white copies of your passport and your driver's license and you carry them with you uh, when you go out and about. And, I, you know, we used to say that that used to serve as adequate identification just in case you were stopped by the authorities. Uh, and, and, you know, I would always recommend that you leave the originals at home, uh, back at your safe, uh, you know, wherever you are, if you're, if you're a hotel or your, your condo or whatever. Well, evidently that will not work anymore. Uh, you need to have the originals with you at all times, uh, when you're walking around, walking about, or you might risk being hauled off to jail. Now, here's the law as it's written, and it's carried out. So listen up. This is, uh, this is uh, the U.S. mission to Mexico. It says, U.S. citizens are reminded that if you enter Mexico by land and plan to travel beyond the immediate border area, you must stop at a National Migration Institute or INM uh, office to obtain an entry permit or forma migratoria multipal 
or FMN, even if it's not explicitly uh, directed to uh, by Mexican officials. So this is for people that actually like drive across the border. Uh, but of course, when you're flying in, you know, we're, we got that too. Uh, when traveling in Mexico, the law requires that foreign visitors carry a passport and entry permit. Uh, you may be asked to present these documents at any point. Uh, if you don't present these documents, immigration authorities may lawfully detain you for up to 60 days while they review your immigration status. Immigration checkpoints are common in the interior of Mexico, including in popular tourist areas far from the border. U.S. citizens resident in Mexico should carry their resident identification cards at all times. Uh, the actions you need to take are you need to obtain an entry permit, your FMM, at your INM office if you're entering Mexico through a land border and traveling beyond the immediate border area. Uh, next, you need to carry your passport and entry permit, your FMM, with you. And for U.S. citizens who reside in Mexico, you need to carry your resident identification card. Uh, and uh, that's that. So uh, I have a link to that announcement from the website at the U.S. Consulate in Mexico. Uh, they are in the show notes. You can find it at www.portofridertravelshow.com. And remember now that it is important uh, to actually carry around your passport and your tourist cards with you at all times, especially when you're traveling from town to town, uh, you know, driving around, even on a bus, uh, even, like I said, if you are a temporary resident or a permanent day, you got to carry the original card with you at all times. And uh, there have been reports of immigration officials uh, checking the status of tourists as they walk around town, and they will. They'll arrest you. They'll take you to jail if you can't present them with the proper identification. Uh, and it can be kind of tricky, especially if you're like me, if you're a single traveler, uh, you know, I'm usually walking around uh, by myself. And if I were going to be stopped, uh, I could be arrested and nobody would be there to help me. So at least if you're with friends, uh, you usually are when you're traveling. One of them could actually go back to your hotel or, you know, wherever you happen to be staying. They could locate your passport and your FMM card. They could bring it to the jail <laughs> and they can prove who you are. And, um, and of course, that would be the original document. So it seems to me like uh, it's time to look for ways that we can carry our passports and our FMM cards with us. I don't know how, maybe like maybe money belts or maybe built-in pockets in your pants. I don't know, but I will report back. And if um, if I find something that, that actually works, and if any of you have any ideas how to carry around your passports without getting them wet or even worse, just losing them, uh, please share with us, share with me. Uh, because it looks like we're all going to have to get used to doing uh, just that. So get used to carrying around your passport and don't lose it. And speaking about getting rested, uh, rousted uh, by the authorities, uh, it looks like some rogue police officers in town have decided to extort pesos from tourists just in time for the holiday gift buying, if you know what I mean. Uh, you know, come on. Hey, cops need to buy stuff for their loved ones, too. They do have loved ones, you know. Anyway, it seems that uh, the uh, some local cops have been harassing folks as they leave clubs uh, in the romantic zone, and they seem to be harassing and extorting members of the gay community. Uh, the police chief met with expats and members of the LGBT uh, community, and uh, I have a link to the story from Out and About PV uh, titled Commissioner Responds to Concerns Over Police Extortion in Puerto Vallarta. Uh, you can find that article in the show notes, but the gist of it is that there was a meeting between the members of the gay community and uh, the, the police chief regarding alleged extortion of tourists in Puerto Vallarta by the cops. Uh, people were being stopped late at night or very early in the morning, and uh, the cops were hassling them, and, and they were demanding money. And in some cases, they would actually uh, drive the, the victim to their hotel or their resort or their Airbnb, and they'd have them retrieve their credit cards and then drive them around town to a, you know ATMs all around and um, empty their bank accounts. Uh, now, this is very, very disturbing, uh, and it is not the first time that this has happened in Puerto Vallarta. The last time uh, this kind of chicanery was going on, I think it was around three years ago. And the officers who were doing the bad stuff were allegedly, they were allegedly, they were rooted out and they were transferred out of the area. Uh, now, the advice from the police commissioner is the following, and this is from that article from Out and About PV. 
It reads, nationals or foreign tourists are urged to make a report in person to the security police station on their website or through a uh, QR code that was created for this type of situation. The QR code opens up a chat on WhatsApp uh, to report the cases. Uh, the WhatsApp account is labeled Comisaria de Seguridad Ciudadana, uh, Puerto Vallarta, Jalisco, and you're urged to add it to your contact list in case it's needed. Uh, the anonymous complaint line via WhatsApp was established in late October by the Dictorate of Citizen Security and Municipal Road of Puerto Vallarta in order that the Vallartan residents can co- uh, report criminal behavior, including police extortion, and request advice if they have been victims of insecurity or abuse. Uh, the call should be uh, to a number, and I'll, I'll read it to you, 322 Two four two six nine eight two, or basically just scan the QR code that comes attached to this advertised uh, photograph. And I have a copy of that ad as well as the QR code, as well as the WhatsApp number. I got all that stuff in the show notes. Uh, you'll want to add that to your phone list if you have one, that is. And uh, my suggestion is, uh, and theirs is too, is just to be very careful when you're leaving clubs late at night alone. Uh, go with a group. Uh, don't get wasted and hit the streets late at night. Take an Uber, if possible. Uh, and if you take a cab, don't let them split you up with, from your friends. Don't let them separate you guys and gals. Uh, I've heard about taxistas actually doing the same stunt. Uh, actually, recently, several people I know have been abused uh, by taxi drivers in uh, coordination with some of these rogue policemen uh, and women. And you really need to be careful and have your wits about you, you, gay or straight, it doesn't matter, okay? And I really, you know, and me, you know, I really have to behave because I'm always walking around late at night all alone. So I definitely um, watch what I'm doing. And you all should do the same. All right. Uh, well, uh, anyway, I got that link and all that other stuff in the show notes. Also, watch your purse. Uh, don't hang it over your chair. Uh, keep an eye on your cell phone. There has been a spate of uh, purse snatchings and lifting of wallets lately in town as well. Uh, Ladies, uh, try not to carry a bag with you if you can help it. Uh, But if you must, a crossbody strap works really well. And when you are seated at a table, a purse in your lap is preferred to slung over your chair. And uh, we, we must always, always keep aware because, uh, you know, they're, the, the bad guys are looking for opportunities. And if you give them a chance, they will take that opportunity. They are there uh, and they're seem you know, it is high season. So look out. I mean, even though the town is packed with tourists, uh, there are still many around there that are trying to make ends meet. Uh, okay, well, enough of this bad news. Uh, for some good news, let's see here. Uh, it's whale watching season in uh, Puerto Vallarta, and uh, the whales managed again to find their way back to uh, the Bahia de Banderas. Uh, so if you are going to be in town, make sure you you know, make make a little room for an excursion to get out there on the bay, or at least keep your eye out on the water. You never know what you might see. Uh, all right, uh, let's get some more good news from our guests, shall we? It's been a long, long time since our last visit with Bob Price. Bob is the founder and creator of the Vallarta Botanical Garden, and that's located just 40 minutes by bus south of Puerto Vallarta. And if you've never been to the garden, you just need to get over there. Uh, When I busted up there a couple weeks ago with my friend Polly, I could not believe how things have grown and matured. I've got lots of pictures. You're going to have to check them out in the show notes or just get down there and take a look for yourself. Uh, there's so many flowers. There's so many butterflies. It was just beautiful. The nature, every turn, it was just lovely. Um, anyway, I set up my recording equipment over in the middle of the beautiful restaurant they have over at the Botanical Garden. Uh, it's just surrounded by flowers and hummingbirds and hanging hanging baskets with, oh, you know, flowers, orchids, and great stuff like that. Uh, and then, of course, the beautiful green mountains as the backdrop. Uh, you could hear the faint sound of the Rio Horcones, actually, in the background. It is a magical place to sit and have a meal and to have a conversation about a garden 
uh, of the botanical variety. <laughs> so uh, let's go sit down right now uh, over at the botanical garden and let's talk with our friend uh, Roberto, uh, Bob Price of the Vallarta Botanical Garden. Bob, thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you, Barry. It's my pleasure to be with you. Um, so there's new stuff, new stuff happening. Uh, you know, we're all, we're all coming back. We're all coming back. Yeah. So tell us what's going on. Well, it's uh, amazing and awesome. Uh, we've been uh, receiving record crowds of uh, visitors returning to Puerto Vallarta. Even, even in, uh, uh, back in October, we started getting uh, twice as busy as we had normally been in past Octobers, and that has continued right up uh, till now. So it looks like uh, if that darn whatever that new variant is doesn't cause problems, uh, we should have a really good year here in Puerto Vallarta. New high season. Yeah, it's looking mm-hmm. that way for sure. And yeah. uh, when I'm walking through the gardens, I'm just blown away by all the flowers. I mean, what is going on? You got you, what'd you do? Did you like uh, multiply these by uh, forty or fifty? <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, I, I just uh, wanted to welcome everybody back to the gardens and back to Puerto Vallarta. And uh, so it was really not too much of a stretch for me to go, how, how can I best do that? I, and I said, I think I'm just going to plant more flowers and have more blooming orchids and plants available for our visitors, our new visitors and returning visitors to enjoy uh, more than ever before. So if it, it, we're really getting decked out. Uh, we're still we're still doing the flower beds, installing new stuff too. So we're not quite done yet, but uh, there's uh, that's definitely new. I think people have noticed that. I've gotten a lot of positive feedback about all the flowers so far, but uh, there's a lot of things that haven't really even come into bloom yet. So it's sort of timed to last all season, it'll yeah. last until April, right? So, right, right. That's the way to do it. Right? Yeah, yeah. And um, another something new, which is uh, worth uh, checking out at the gardens, is our newly uh, remodeled uh, chapel. Uh, which is called Nuestra Señora del Jardín, uh, Our Lady of the Garden. And uh, it's the spiritual center of our botanic garden. And uh, it just went through an amazing transformation of a remodeling. Uh, it, uh, I invite you to go see it. It's, um, it's done by a, a group of artists, uh, Austin Young and David Allen Burns. And uh, they're famous for their, uh, for their um, technique that they have now installed in important museums uh, all around the world. We're very lucky to have one of their collections here on public display in Puerto Vallarta. Uh, and uh, it's uh, it's uh, called Angelitos de Mexico, or the Little Angels of Mexico. Mm-hmm. And it's a, uh, a theme on uh, hummingbirds and also of photographs of flowers that uh, were taken here at the Botanical Garden. Wow. So our garden is famous for our hummingbirds. We have a really, very busy hummingbird season here where a lot of birders come out to enjoy the 13 different species of hummingbirds. We have a very uh, a lot of biodiversity with the birds, and especially the hummingbirds here. You can see some pretty interesting species, either at the feeders or walking in the garden. And uh, also we feed the tropical birds. We have a bird feeder where a lot of uh, very beautiful birds uh, that uh, come in and delight us with their beautiful bright colors. And uh, every day uh, you can see them from the restaurant balcony. Uh, also new, we have some new things on the menu up, up there in the restaurant. We're trying to really lean our menu into uh, traditional Mexican cuisine, uh, sourcing the best uh, Mexican ingredients wherever we find them. If we need to get uh, the black corn, uh, we have a guy in Oaxaca that sends us the black corn uh, or other art, uh, artisanal corn or heirloom varieties of, uh, of uh, things that are in season that we can use in our restaurant. Oh, wow. So okay. people, people are looking for an authentic experience uh, of Mexico. I think that we've got it here, and I think they're going to be delighted by what they will find at the gardens and also in the restaurant. So. Yeah. Well, I'll have pictures of, uh, of, of, you know, I've gone all around here and taken some great pictures, so I'll have those in the show notes as well, uh, but as well as the chapel and the new design there. It, um, it's, it's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Um, you have any plans uh, coming up for... You know, any any events? Got things maybe planned for next year? Or? Uh, well, we we just went through uh, three. We, we just went through three uh, big events uh, in November, but yes, that's, that's behind us now. We had a huge Thanksgiving out here, ah. American Thanksgiving, where we uh, served over four hundred people. Wow! And uh, <laughs> it was a huge success. And we had the garden's sixteenth uh, anniversary or sixteenth birthday on the sixteenth of November. Oh wow! So okay. we're I six, it. sixteen years old now. And, uh, 
and uh, so and the other thing was the Dia de los Muertos uh, party that we had uh, on the second, which was also the grand opening of the new chapel. Uh. So we, we we do the Dia de los Muertos event every every year uh, here at the gardens. We have a scattering garden, uh, which is uh, where a lot of our members uh, have chosen as their eternal resting place. So we just are doing ashes. That uh, you can uh, go see the uh, the scattering garden and and the cemetery at the, out at the church. We also have a pet cemetery here uh. Uh, that's really quite a unique and beautiful little place for your pet. Once your pet crosses the Rainbow Bridge, uh, you can bring them to us and we'll take care of that for you. But uh, a lot of people are, ca- are calling the uh, Botanical Garden their, their final home, their final resting place. And yeah. of course, that will be mine too. Uh. I, uh, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not <laughs> let's say, looking forward to that day. No, but when no. it, when it comes, way, I'll be in it. Way, way in the future. Way, way, way in the future. <laughs> uh, that, that will be where I'm going to be. My mom's there. And so it's, uh, it's, it's a beautiful place on a beautiful hillside overlooking the garden. So, you yeah. know, we'll be, I think we'll be at peace over there. I think so, too. Yeah. I agree. Uh, uh, anything else you want to add? Is there anything else uh, you uh, Um I just want to encourage people uh, here in Puerto Vallarta to do your best to help with the garbage uh, situation that we have. Our, our new administration is uh, just coming up to speed on that. We have a lot of... Um, a lot of need uh, for everyone to pitch in, uh, maybe even become a, a leader in your neighborhood, so we can have uh, nice, clean streets and um, and uh, uh, be ready for tourism, uh, which is our main uh, economic engine here. We have to keep the town nice and spruced up, uh, and everybody needs to pitch in. So I would mention that. I would mention to everyone to be very uh, cautious and frugal with your water consumption, and to uh, make lifestyle choices that uh, help our planet. And uh, you, you, we've all heard the news. It's uh, sounding kind of dire, but sure, there's lots of things we can do and should do in our daily lives. And that includes things like generate less trash, take care of uh, water, uh, uh, cherish it and not waste it, and, and just sort of things like that. We, know, we all know what we can do, but everybody has to pitch in. There's still time, but we got to act now. Absolutely. I'm glad you said that. Mm-hmm. I'm really glad you said yeah. that. Yeah. I'd also like to mention uh, uh, something new at the gardens. Uh, it, it's not exactly new. We've been doing it since uh, around 2005. Is uh, We're acquiring uh, lands that are adjacent to the gardens, und- undeveloped lands, uh, forested lands, and bringing them into our uh, preserve uh, with our goal is to make a, a large uh, wildlife preserve here. Uh, the gardens is in the unique position of being in the middle of uh, pretty unspoiled territory here in uh, western Mexico, uh, but uh, it's under threat. We see the development going on here, and so we would like to create a, a, a permanent sanctuary for the animals and plants that also call Puerto Vallarta home, and we've already undertaken that. If anybody wants to participate uh, in that, we're raising money. Uh, uh, we're asking people to donate to this. This is a, also has a lot to do with climate change and uh, deforestation, uh, which was mentioned at the Glasgow Summit recently as one of the things that uh, nations actually could do. Uh, it's almost impossible to rein in the fossil fuel industries such as we've built the whole civilization around them. Uh, but one of the things we can take a, a whack at is trying to stop the deforestation uh, and uh, protecting uh, lands and habitats. So we're try- we are doing that. We've already started doing it. And we would la- ask anybody who'd like to participate in that uh, uh, to help us make this preserve just to contact me at the Botanical Garden. Uh, you, you, have, you have information of that in the show notes, and I will, I'll have it in the show notes. So we'll definitely do that. Uh, Bob, thanks for, uh, for having me here at the garden today. It is absolutely beautiful. No, do not miss it. When you come to Puerto Vallarta, there is no reason for you to miss it. The trip up here is, 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 half, is half the fun, and the trip back, of course. But once you get here, you're in paradise. Thanks a lot, Barry. Good to see you. Thank you, Bob. I have links to everything that we talked about in the show notes. Uh, Make sure you get to the garden if you get a chance. Uh, You will love it there. Okay. Now, my featured guest is a guy that I met at a bar. That's right. Uh, Actually, I met uh, him in front of a bar. Okay. It was was the Salty Caesar over on uh, Madero. And uh, I was delivering some terpenes that I milled down for a buddy of mine who makes oils, the medicinal type, you know, the kind that you smoke or drop on your tongue, you know. Uh, now, terpenes, 
Terpenes are what gives your vape oil that Girl Scout cookie flavor or that wedding cake flavor or that Maui Waui or whatever kind of flavor you want. That's what terpenes are. And anyway, I was making it's okay. Totally, totally legal. Everybody that was, don't worry about that. Anyway, we were, we were discussing his, uh, his chemistry projects at the time. And of course we were solving the world's problems. And it, one day I need to recount that discussion. That's for another day. But anyway, we were solving the problems of the world, and up walks Tomas. And uh, Tomas is the guy you're about ready to meet. And we got to talking, and immediately I knew that I had to have this guy on the podcast. Uh, Tomas lives in Yalapa. Uh, he's from uh, Southern California. And he's got a lot of knowledge of the area. And uh, he introduced me to some of... Uh, the best tasting salt <laughs> that I have ever tasted. That's right, salt. Uh, anyway, I cornered him and he said yes, he would talk to me. And so the next day before he took off on a panga with uh, you know, all supplied up and ready to return to Yalapa, I asked him if he would join me for breakfast at one of my favorite places. Hey, I did actually just interviewed Amy Armstrong last week over at Cuatas y Cuetas, where I love their chilequeles verdes con pollo. And Tomas came to join me for breakfast, and uh, he shared his story and his knowledge and his experiences of a magical place uh, south of Puerto Vallarta. So, uh, off to Cuatas y Cuetas, and let's talk about Yalapa with my buddy Tomas, the salt guy. Tomas, thanks for coming on the show today. <laughs> thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from, and what was your path that led you to Puerto Vallarta? Well, I grew up in Hollywood, of all places. Good place to be from. Yeah. Um, I had a little natural food store in Northern California for a short while, and I had some of my customers come in and said, we've been to a place we think you'd really like. And they ended up sending me to Yalapa. At that time, Yalapa had no electricity. What year was that? Uh, 1980. 1980. Wow, yeah. wow. That's four years before my first visit here. Oops. <laughs> wow. All right. So. so, yeah, like I said, no electricity. We barely had running water, but somebody had come in, nicknamed Pipeline Jim, and he put in a bunch of galvanized pipes to bring water throughout the little village. Pipeline Jim. Pipeline Jim. He came on his sailboat <laughs> with galvanized pipes. Wow. How long did they last? They're still there. They're still there, aren't they? <laughs> I've seen them, yeah, yeah, they yeah. are still there. Yeah. Wow. Uh, uh, so t t it tells you the difference between galvanized and plastic. <laughs> the uh, plastic, we've gone through several plastic, where, where they tried to give us municipal water and the plastic just didn't last or never got finished. But now we got a pr pretty decent uh, system for water, except that I've been out of water for two weeks over there. Oh, yeah. We just uh, had a little, uh, little storm go through little here. storm, messed up the pipes. Yeah. And they're still trying to fix them. Uh, that latest, our latest uh, storm with Nora. We're talking about Nora, aren't That's we? That's Nora, yeah. So with Nora, uh, what kind of damage? Uh, in, wasn't in too Yalapa? bad. Wasn't too bad in Yalapa. Yes, yeah, some people I think lost their houses, uh, building too close to the river. Mm -hmm. So that teaches you to build on stilts or something. Yeah. Um, but it's hard. It's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. <laughs> They're <laughs> hey, going to keep know, building, right? Riverfront. It's a great yeah. property, right? right. <laughs> Good while it lasts. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. So uh, that was in 1980. And yeah. how long did you stay? Uh, I don't remember staying very long. Maybe a week. But I kept coming back for more punishment. Uh huh. <laughs> uh, it is a paradise over there. It's pretty much pristine. Uh, it's uh, definitely a different culture. They had a different uh, way of speaking Spanish, more sing-song. Of course, that is disappearing yeah. over these last 40 years. Um, but uh, we get around by either walking or many people have horses and burros. Uh, we have quadrimotos, which are your ATVs. And uh, I use my bicycle a lot. Ah, really? So in Yalapa, keep keep exercise up. Uh huh. Walk a lot. Yeah, yeah. And we have to carry everything, so we all turn into burros because we have to cart stuff in. Everything has to be brought in by boat. 
or by the road, but that takes a lot longer. So certain materials will come down by trucks. All right, so let's talk about that road. Uh, how do people drive into Yalapa? Most people come by boat. The boats are, you can take, pick them up right here at Los Muertos Beach at the pier. And that'll be about a one-hour boat ride. And, um, and you, it'll take you back here to the same place. But there's a, like a halfway point, which is called Boca de Tomatlan, where when I drive down here, I leave my par- car parked safely in Boca de Tomatlan. And I take a half-hour boat ride into Yalapa. Okay. Now, uh, this is always kind of tricky for, at least for me, you know, at first, and I'm sure for a lot of people, it's a little bit confusing. If you're going to be taking a boat colectivo, in other words, the cheapest way to get from the Los Muertos Pier uh, to the Yalapa Pier, there's a way, right? You, you, how do you do that? How do you, how do you do that without getting ripped off or getting sold a tour or, you know, getting put on a Pongo with two other people and paying extra money. I mean, how do, how do we do this? That's true. We have a we have a system usually set up depending on uh, the amount of people uh, that are looking for boats. Um, you usually can walk out to the end of the pier, or you can ask people what time are the boats. But many will try to sell you a ticket, especially a round trip ticket. Um, I've always just gotten on the boat, and then I pay when I get there. I figure if I don't make it, I won't have to pay the trip. <laughs> <laughs> now, do they let you do that, or would they let some guy do that, or they, they just know you and they let you do that? Um, I think they'll let just about anybody do it, you know, but they, they like it if you buy a round-trip ticket. That way you're kind of stuck taking them back. Okay, so if you buy a round-trip ticket, you're stuck with that Collectivo, right? That public ticket, which, and they have several boats, so the ticket will work on several different boats, okay. but not on all of them. Oh, okay. So it's best to get a one-way t- one ticket, right? Get a right? one-way ticket. Well, no, just get on the boat. Just get on the boat. Just get on the boat and pay when you get there. Okay. Sometimes so that- they're there to collect the ticket ahead of time, to collect your money ahead of time. Okay. But now, all right, so how do you know which is the boat? Which, which boat is it? I mean, you know. How that, do you, how well, do you, all of them have a name, one? of course. But there's uh, 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 Marbella is one of them. Uh, Jack's Water Taxi. There's another one. Uh, but there are several, and they kind of, like, take turns. Okay. Okay. All right. So, so you when just you find out boat, what the hours say, hey, are. This yeah. is Collectivo, and how much? You ask them how much, right? Ask them how much. You always ask how much if ahead of time. Always, right. And so how much is it, a Collectivo? <laughs> how much does it cost? So I don't know what they charge, because I'm a frequent flyer, so I pay a frequent flyer price. Okay. You know. But uh, I think it might be, like, a couple hundred pesos one way. Okay. So it's like it's ten bucks each way, maybe yeah. something like that. Yeah. All right. So it's not bad at all. Not bad at all. Um, and you know, we're talking about a, a beautiful, uh, you know, hour-long boat ride. I mean, they, they go beautiful. pretty fast. They go fast. They're pretty quick, and I I don't see anybody getting seasick. Mm-hmm. It was in the old days when we had to take the big double-decker boat out. A lot of people get seasick from those, but then they started having these pangas with one motor on the back, and hopefully we made it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. But now they're, they've got quite sophisticated motors, and they take care of their boats pretty well because it's good business. Yeah, it is. Yeah, you don't have a boat, you got no money. Right. <laughs> um, all right, so when did you decide that you were going to like live in Yalapa? Well, it took several trips out here just because I was enamored with the place. Uh, I had put into my mind that I wanted to live in a place that was tropical, uh, that had mountains and sea, which Ilapa has both mountains and sea. Um, I wanted, of course, warmth, tropical fruit, and fresh fish. And you can't get any fresher than Ilapa because they catch it and they bring it to the restaurant and you're eating fresh fish pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll get to restaurants in a minute, but you were trying to figure this out and this had everything you needed. It was checking all your boxes. Right. Now, how old were you when you, uh, when you made your first I was trip? 30. You were 30 years old. Yeah. Wow, okay. And I just took a little vacation to Mexico. I knew that I liked Mexico. I liked the culture and I liked the food. And, um, well, I had a friend of mine who was pushing me, hey, I, you know, we were divers off the coast of California where you have to wear a full body suit and he wanted to go diving in a place where you didn't have to wear anything but your skivvies. <laughs> and so we came down here, and that's what we did. And at that point, I met a lovely Mexican girl, and 
uh, fell hell head over heels uh-huh. and ended up marrying her. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, well, you know, it's about time. You were 30, right? Right. All right, yeah. And uh, we moved inland to the Lake Chapala area, retirement community for a lot of Americans and Canadians. Yeah. And uh, now well, this, that's a whole other story. This, this, <laughs> this girl was from Yalapa? Well, she was originally from Lake Chapala area. Oh, okay. But uh, that's where I met her. Oh, okay. All right. So, um, I don't see the wife here. We're, uh, that, was a, that, was... Yeah, that was a long time ago. Okay, very good. <laughs> <laughs> that lasted uh, six years. Okay. It was the best and the worst. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, hey, uh, you never know where the heart's going to pull you, right? Exactly right. Exactly right. So, you left Lake Chapala. Left Lake Chapala and started going to Europe uh-huh. after things didn't pan out. Right. I uh, figured I was going to move to Europe. Well, that didn't pan out as well as I'd liked it to, even though I did uh, I did have a good time in, in Europe. I have a French passport, so it allowed me to work anywhere in Europe. Mm. And um, I, those are other stories. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I kept coming back here because, well, we had kids, this little Mexican girl and I. So while I was trying to see the kids. It wasn't, it wasn't easy. Yeah, I bet. It was a chore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So you got back, um, I mean, when was it that you decided that you were going to you were gonna live there? Well, part of that was because I wanted to be somewhat close to my kids, even though they were, you know, five hours away. Uh, at least I was here for them. Mm-hmm. So I started building a little house so I can leave them something. If I ever end up permanently in Europe or in America, they've got something that they can fall back on. Ah, nice. Nice, nice. And so you built a house over in the I Alpha? built a house, yeah. And uh, that was uh, brought in all probably by boat, right? Yes. <laughs> the cement, the wood, the metal, the electrical parts, the plumbing parts, everything has to come in by boat. So everything ends up costing you more. But since I do a lot of the stuff myself, I was able to uh, build a little two-story. Very good, very good. And so. on the mountainside, out of the flood zone. <laughs> yes, right, Important. because you planned that. You did that on purpose, yes. didn't you? Mm-hmm. Uh, the How do the um, people in the village uh, take the fact that uh, some gringos build a house in their village? Well, I'm not actually in the village, but, yeah, well, they're always welcoming the tourist dollars. And... Um, we bring a certain amount of excitement to this little village, right? <laughs> we have our disco. <laughs> uh, they cater to us pretty much. There, there are 35 eating establishments in Yalapa, a little village of 1,500 to 2,000 people. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we have a variety of nice restaurants, and everything's pretty fresh. So you can't eat any place much healthier than here in Mexico because they start about everything with scratch, from scratch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you are a, uh, uh, we were talking a little earlier, you, you, you like to bake. I like to bake. I've uh, been baking since I was 14 years old. You, uh, you're, you, you're an electrician. I'm an electrician. I'm a plumber. I'm a carpenter. I'm <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, this all came in really handy when you're building your place. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I'm guessing that you probably help other people too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. People call me up and say, Hey, can you fix what so-and-so broke? <laughs> <laughs> Well, then good. I mean, you're very handy to have around the village, right? Yeah. So uh, they accept me, and that the fact that I learned to speak their language mm-hmm. helps a lot. And then I was raised by European parents, so they taught me to be polite at all times. So you always say hello when you enter a store, a uh, restaurant. You say hello first. Yeah. That's the first sign of politeness is to do that. And thank you and excuse me and I'm sorry. Right. All those, all those things. Help. All those pol- uh, politenesses. Yeah. The, those are all important and uh, obviously go a long way yeah. because they like you. They like me. <laughs> I was also doing the uh, telephone book there for a while. The telephone book. Yeah, we had a telephone book and everybody's got a nickname. So you can look up somebody's nickname in the phone book and find their number. Oh, wow. Okay, so you've got a directory for Yalapa. Yes. How funny is that? Wow. Basically a directory of useful numbers for anybody in Yalapa. So it also has numbers for special places in in uh, Puerto Vallarta. Mm, okay, all right. Like the clinics and the consulates and 
places where you can get services. Oh, that's very handy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that gets used every day by people probably. Oh, yeah. They all bugging me right now to do it. But it's a lot of work. Yeah, it is. Uh, Especially it is. when here they lose a phone, they just go get another one with a new number, and then they'll never advise me that, hey, I changed my number. Oh, yeah. There is that, <laughs> isn't there? Wow. And that's, that makes total sense, right? You put in a new SIM card and you got a new number. Oh. Um, all right, you said that in Yalapa you got all these eateries, right? Yeah. Uh, most of them, of course, a lot of them dot the beach, right? Yes. And then some are up in some up of the river, establishments. Up river, or there, right? there's a bunch in the village, of course. Yeah. And uh, every so often we get a new one. Uh-huh. So we got a couple of new ones this year. Right. Um, if you were... I mean, you, you've got a lot of these restaurants, right? You, can you name a few of them that uh, are interesting, uh, good good ones? Yeah, there's a bunch on the beach. Like I like Tino's and Coco Bar is one. Marlin's is another. And we used to have the hotel restaurant, which was very good, but the hotel is kind of in shambles right now. Oh, really? It got, uh, it got pretty much abandoned. Oh. Oh, so it was, we're not talking water damage. We're talking like... Well, now it's water damage, yeah. but in the old days, it was we had a, a guy who took pretty good care of the place. Had a bar and a restaurant that was functioning. We had some events there, costume balls and stuff like that. Oh, wow. <laughs> so now that's over, and they're just starting to repair some of the cabanas, because it's cabanas, it's not like a hotel hotel. Um, that was one of our favorite places. But there's a bunch of little places on the beach. Which are cater to the day crowd. Yeah. And then we have a bunch of restaurants in the village and upriver for okay. the evening crowds. Okay, so let's talk about uh, some of the ones that are in the village. Uh, well, we have like the favorite, the all time favorite is Pollo Boyo. They've been for, there forever. Good little Christian family and they take care of everybody pretty well. And then we have uh, our, uh, one of our latest ones was Los Abuelos, which uh, the guy that uh, opened that up. He was one of the cooks at our five-star Los Veranos, Casa Verana, Verana, something like that. Uh, and they're up on the hillside, yeah, out outside of town. Okay. That's kind of a fancy resort type place. So if you were gonna like, if you were gonna go and stay at that pl- fancy resort type place that's way up on the hill, they would probably come down in like ATVs and no, take they their stuff they and like you to stay up there. So they have their own restaurant facilities. I and mean, bars. they have to they they, might, they gotta. They got to be able to haul you and your your luggage up there, right? Right, but yeah. they would prefer that you stay up there. Okay, right? Yeah. Oh, they okay. Wanna, so, they so, so it's an all inclusive. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Yalapa's got their own all inclusive. I like this. <laughs> uh, that's interesting. Okay. Uh, what other places are there to stay? I mean, you know, there are. I, oh, we I have, see a lot of Airbnbs. There's all yes. kinds of stuff going on there. We have some places that are like nice apartments that you can rent. Uh, we also have more rustic places, like El Hardin is a kind of a community type setup where they've got little houses you can rent, and then there's a communal kitchen in the center. Huh? Uh, they've got a great view over the little bay there. Uh, there's also Casa Isabel's, and they sell little cabanas up in the up in the mountains there on the mountainside, overlooking the ocean. Some oh. of them overlooking the ocean. Yeah. Uh, so that's out at the point. Those are those places. And then you've got in the village, and then you've got just outside the village. And uh, we, had, we have different places. They have, like, we have little uh, places where you can rent a tent for <laughs> really? 200 pesos a night. No way. Right? And right. they also, it's run by a woman, April, who does a, a nice job feeding us. So she does little special feasts, like Thanksgiving, things like that. Yeah, wow. Well. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We also have our yearly croquet tournament, uh-huh. <laughs> and after the croquet, croquet tournament, then we have our uh, sweetheart ball, so people get dressed up in costumes, and we have a dance. Wow, this is like, this is like real community, isn't it? <laughs> yes. It's a real community. <laughs> we have our own water filtration plant, which was set up by a gringo years ago, and we're real happy that that happened because we do have good spring water but nobody packaging it and delivering it like they do in five gallon bottles uh-huh. so they either bring it on uh, motorcycle or quadrimoto uh-huh. uh, AT- ATVs and we you know we got our own tortilla factory so they make fresh tortillas uh, and then we have the uh, what what they call the casino and this is uh, once a week we have this 
huge room where the Mexicans go late at night and they play the music as loud as they possibly can. <laughs> Interesting to visit once in a while. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And they're, uh, they're gambling. No, no, that's not even a gambling. It's just go, go there to listen to loud music and maybe dance. Okay, so no, c- casino means t- something totally different. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so once a year, the women have a chance to go out and they can, all the women get dressed up and go to this thing and they can drink beer all they want. Ah, <laughs> ah a good excuse. Yes. A good excuse. Um, all right, so plenty of places to stay. Now, you're out there in, I mean, it is in the middle of nowhere. What's it like uh, at night? Uh, can you see, uh, are we talking a lot, you know, the sky full of stars? Oh, yes, absolutely. That's one of the special things there. If we have a clear sky, we have incredible uh, expanse of sky with incredible amount of stars. You can't believe there's that many stars out there sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Something rare for a guy who grew up in L.A. who might see three or four stars in the sky. Uh-huh. Because they're all on the street, you know. Well, yeah, we get to stomp on the ones we don't like. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to me that it is a very, very laid-back thing. If you're going to be staying there, you probably aren't thinking, uh, gosh, what am I going to do today? What are we going to do today? Except for, like, walk down to the beach and eat and drink and have a good time, right? I mean, is that basically yes. what's going on there? that's what a lot of people do, and that's what all they expect, but... Um, it's a wonderful walk to walk up river on one side of the river and walk down the other side. Huh? Uh, lots of flowering plants. We have an incredible amount of fauna and uh, all kinds of birds from the guacamayas, which are the uh, military macaws, to uh, the tiniest little birds that have an incredible song that they sing every morning. Um, there are views. Wherever you go, there's views. You can walk out to the points. Uh, you can swim from the little beaches or from the rocks. A uh, great place for diving. I love to dive there. It's just uh, we have a lot of fish out there yeah. still. Yeah. Yet, yeah. Yay. Even though I complain about the Mexican government years ago gave the Japanese the right to bring in their 13 kilometer sea nets, and they pretty much wiped it out for a lot of fishermen. Wow, I didn't know that. Yes, they wow. also uh, another corrupt part of the government sold the rights to the Japanese to all the hardwood trees from the coast to one kilometer inland and they came in and they took out all the hardwoods. Wow. So it's a little sad but things are growing back. Takes a long time. Yeah. Yeah. But um, we're just hoping that we have less and less jungle destruction here. Yeah. It's very important. Yeah. So we do have laws in place that will fine people for cutting down trees illegally. You have to have a permit. Uh, Most people... Don't pay any attention to those laws. Right. But at least we don't have the wholesale massacre, like big industries coming in and taking everything they possibly can. Yeah, wiping it out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You have uh, several waterfalls in Yalapa as well. We have a little town waterfall. It's like about a five-minute walk from the village. And uh, right now it's going... I'm sure it's just Full tilt boogie, yes. Yeah. Which is beautiful, but, you know, eventually it gets to a trickle. Uh, and then there's one that's an hour up river, so you can walk up river, and it's pretty self-explanatory because a well-worn path. Yeah. And those are waterfalls people like to hang out at during the day. So they'll go in the morning and just hang out all day, bring food with them. Uh, there is a little restaurant way up river, Christina's little restaurant uh, on the edge of the river. Uh, she's vegan, nice little vegan restaurant. Uh huh. Uh, other than that, there's not much up there. Yeah. Just the nature. Now, do they have, uh, I understand they also have like uh, pack horses or mules that go up there too? Or yes. No? You can uh, rent horses uh, on the beach behind the restaurants. And you can go with a guide or if you already know the place, you can just take the horses and or they'll take you up. And they'll want to run back, of course. Oh, boy. Feed yeah. me, feed me. Right. So hang on tight. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I bet you, and make sure that your uh, your uh, medical insurance is up to date too you before go. you do that. <laughs> there are no guarantees. <laughs> no guarantees. That's right. Oh man. Um, all right. If you had, if someone was coming to Yalapa just for the day, tell us run it, run through maybe what they should do. I mean, you know, so they can get the most out of their day. Well, the first thing you have to do, of course, is sit at one of the restaurants on the beach and have a margarita or two. Mm-hmm. 
Then you can go rent a horse <laughs> behind the restaurant if you can still stand. <laughs> but once you're on the seated on the horse, it's, it takes care of itself. Uh huh. It knows where to and go. And you go up river. You go up, and you see just how people live. Um, uh, you can see the gardens. A lot of uh, the Mexican people love to have little gardens and flowers and things. Uh huh. So that's all fun. Yeah. And like I said, all kinds of animals. We got those big iguanas. We got those big garobos, which are a carnivore, where the iguanas are vegetarian animals. They mm. eat flowers and leaves. Uh, we have so all kinds of. So a garobo is it looks like a. It's iguana? a big lizard. It's a huge. It's a huge lizard. Yeah. Uh, they're not dangerous. Uh, they 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 all run away. All the animals want to run away <laughs> from you, rather. <laughs> but they're nice to see up in the trees often. Uh huh. And um, and we have all kinds of snakes, but fewer and fewer. It's like, you know, there's a thing here in Mexico. If it's a snake, you have to kill it because it's the embodiment of the devil or something. I'm not sure, but... <laughs> <laughs> Poor snakes. Poor snakes. Yeah, yeah. So I, if I find them and they've caught a snake and I beg them to give it to me so I can go let it go in the forest. Uh, look at you. You're, you're that guy. <laughs> you're that guy. Um, I know the snakes appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, but they do, yeah. Hopefully they don't turn around and, and give your appreciation in a different way, yes. right? <laughs> um, all right, and then, of course, you want to get back to, you want to find that Collectivo that you came on, yes. or if you if you actually went and bought a two-way, or you can just walk up and yeah. hop on a Collectivo. Hop on any kind of boat that's going in that in this direction. Either come into Boca. From Boca, you can take a taxi or a, a bus back into Vallarta. Or if you find a boat, I think the last boat from Bo- from uh, Yalapa to Vallarta is like 5 o'clock. Or no, to Boca, I think it is. Uh, then Yeah, then you're stuck taking a taxi or the bus. Okay. The bus is always an interesting little ride. You know. Yeah, the bus <laughs> is fun. Just don't take it during um, uh, shift change hours, right? Yeah, absolutely. They, they fill up. Yeah, they do, and uh, they like to fill them up, and they yeah. fill them up so that they're hanging out the doors. Practically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they do. I was just on one the other day, and yes. I told my son, watch this thing fill up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Let's come to Puerto Vallarta a little bit. Let's leave Yalapa just okay. for a little while, because you've been here. You've lived here all your, it seems like, half your life, right? Yes. So... You are vegan. I'm pretty much vegan. I'll eat a little fish. Okay. So what what kind of restaurants do you like here in town? Uh, we have a lot of good restaurants, but I'm very squeamish about a lot of them because a lot of them are geared just for the tourists. Yeah. So I like uh, Archie's Walk. I always feel safe and feel comfortable after eating at Archie's Walk. And this was, uh, Archie was the cook for John Houston. And uh, and they're still going strong after all these years. Yeah, they're they still are. a favorite to a lot of people. So when I have guests, I bring them there. Uh, I also eat at certain street venues. Yeah. Do they have but like because vegan, I, vegan I, choices at these? Street well, venues? they'll make me vegetarian tacos. You know, a lot of places they don't understand vegetarian tacos. They'll give you a meat taco and then leave the meat out, and that leaves you with six beans. <laughs> If they even give you beans. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so what are you putting on? You're putting onions, you're putting beans, you're putting uh, mushrooms, right? They've got all that stuff going. Yeah, I like I like the rajas, which is a uh, kind of a bell pepper, a dark bell pepper. Uh, nopales, which is a cactus. And, uh, yeah, so they, often it varies because it depends on what they have. Yeah. Uh, baked potatoes. They'll chop them up, put them in there, and then, of course, handmade salsas. I always love the fresh-made salsas, which I call house salsas. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm never at a loss for food here. People say, how can, you, how can you eat here when you're a vegetarian? It's all meat. I said, I just tell them what I want, and they make me what I want. Yeah. yeah. So there's little places, like there's a little place called Lupita's on San Sebastian's. And uh, she gives me a big bowl of uh, rice and bean soup with all the vegetables in it and handmade tortillas. And uh, definitely doesn't charge me enough, so I always leave a good tip. Yeah. <laughs> good point for everybody to remember that. Yes. I like to leave a good tip. Uh, well, I've always been in the food industry 
food service industry, so I always leave a good tip. Some people say, well, you can't do that because then they expect it. Uh, this may be, but I know that they're appreciative of the little extra money I give them. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, when uh, Okay, so those are places to eat. What about if you were going to, you know, for a, a day trip other than Yalapa, what's a, what's a cool place to go? One of the things uh, we used to do back in the old days was we'd take a boat out to Chimo. And Chimo on a Sunday, they have like a seafood, uh, I don't know if you can call it a buffet, but it's a feast. Uh-huh. And it's all the different seafoods they can muster up on a Sunday. And so eat to your heart's content. You take a, a special boat out. You don't have to take a private boat. Private boats, you can take private boats, but they end up costing you. You're going to be paying like probably $100 for $200 for a boat for the day. Yeah. Which is worth it to some people. You know, they got their own boat, their own captain. He takes care of them. And sometimes that's worth it. So uh, we used to like to take the boat out to Las Marietas, the islands. Yeah. Uh, If you have a good boat captain, he'll make you a ceviche when you get to the beach. And you can feast on the beach. In the old days, you used to be able to climb up onto the island. Mm-hmm. It's full of blue-footed boobies who have no enemies, right? No, right. No, no. So they just sit there and squawk at you as you walk by. But now, because somebody got careless and burnt the island, now they don't let anybody on top of the island, which is a good idea. So it's, it's coming back to its own nature reserve. And so we like that. So now we're stuck on the beach. The little beaches, which end up smelling like suntan lotion, <laughs> because they got tour boats going out there. But in the old days, it was like one or two or three boats might go out there. Yeah. With you know four, five, six people, and uh, so now they got the tour boats, which is kind of sad. But it's still an incredible place. It's got a little. Uh, you can uh, dive underwater and go to this little inland pool. Uh, there's another beach on the other side. Uh, which is all rocks. Uh, so It hurts. It hurts, <laughs> but it's interesting because you find shells and different oh, things. Yes, yeah, different yeah. things wash up on that beach. Hardly anybody goes there because it's just rocks. Yeah. yeah, yeah. To get there from when we used to be able to climb the island, we could climb down a pole to get down to the rock beach. Ah, right? okay, yeah. So this was a little... It, before that all happened, it was kind of like a little... Little Disneyland. Exactly. Huh? Yeah. yeah. So it was special. It was a special trip to go out there. Yeah. And that was that's quite a haul, though, right? That's an hour boat ride. Is it? Yeah. yeah. And where would you leave from there? You would leave from Yalapa. Either from Yalapa, but they have boats leaving from Vallarta too. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you can book a, a trip. Sometimes a little group trip, or you can get just get your own private boat. Yeah. If you had three days to go off somewhere, where would you go? A lot of people like to go to Sayulita. That's the other end of the... There's, this is like the Bahia de Banderas, Flag Bay here, uh-huh. which they claim was maybe uh, produced by a meteor that hit this area and created this circle. So we have Cabo Corrientes, which is the south end, and we have Punta Mita, which is the north end, más o menos north, northwest end. And uh, Punta Mita... I understand was bought out by the Japanese, so it's golf courses, expensive golf courses and stuff. But they also have uh, their attraction of a lot of different restaurants and uh, nice hotels to stay at. Uh, Four Seasons is out there. Uh, But it's also like the little, not as quaint as it used to be, because now you can get any kind of food you can imagine, from Italian to uh, Israeli food, you name it, you can find something out there yeah. to suit your tastes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's no longer that little Mexican village. It used to be all dusty. Now they're paving the roads. And But it's an interesting little trip. Yeah, and, uh, you know, if you want to get a contact high, just walk down the street. Exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah, now that it's almost legalized here, yeah. uh, I see people often puffing away on the streets. Yeah. Oh, right yeah. Before they'd have to hide. You get busted <laughs> on the beach at night if you're... 
it was a good uh, good way for cops to make a little extra income. Oh yeah, yeah. This is this is how it's done, right? <laughs> yes. you, you kind of legalize the pot, yes. and then you, it doesn't matter. Right. They, they can still mess with you. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I mean, it was we, they figured it out. Yes. Although I understand that we're going to be having uh, our own. Uh, uh, Dis- pot shop distillery here dispensary, in uh, dispensary, I should yes. say. <clears throat> a dispensary here in Puerto Vallarta, yes. right? Yeah, it's coming up. Of course, they already exist semi clandestinely. Yeah. But um, yes, I understand that they're getting it all geared together that you can still do that. You can find whatever you need in Mexico City and in Guadalajara. Yeah. It's already starting there. Really? Yeah. Wow. They even deliver. Mm-hmm. Right, so you mm-hmm. can get pre-rolled and oils and medicinals and goodies, edibles. Yeah, all right. Look at that. Every See? way, shape, and form. It's uh, <laughs> they're they're coming to they're they're becoming California, you guys. Here yeah. we go. They're doing a better job at growing the stuff. Yeah, yeah. They're understanding yeah. that you know we don't want the chemicals. Please grow organics for us. Very good. Very good. All right. <laughs> So look out for that, guys. It's coming up soon. I'm thinking probably sometime next year we'll probably have the first one here in, in Puerto Vallarta. Um, if you had a word of warning for somebody who is coming to Yalapa, what would the word of warning be? The word of warning in Yalapa generally is watch where you put your hands and your feet. We do have scorpions. We have eight different kinds of scorpions. Some of them are just painful, but some of them are pretty toxic. So you never put your hands where you don't see. You always wear shoes at night. Um, Those are the main things right there. Shake out your bedding. Shake out your shoes. Uh, Well, so far, I mean, I've been living (laughs) there for 40 years. I've never actually shook out my bedding, but I have encountered scorpions. uh, Like under my mattress. They uh-huh. like little tight places. Really? Folded newspapers, magazines, and stuff like that. Always kind of shake those out. Uh, you want to shake out your clothes, even if it's nice and clean and hanging on a hanger or folded. I've been stung by taking a shirt off the hanger, not shaking it out. Putting on a pair of slacks that were folded and oh, clean. Oh, no. Oh, no. So got stung because I didn't shake it out. So you learn to shake things out. Okay. You shake out your shoes. And, uh, yeah. Big, okay, that is... Very important. Very guys. important. Very important. Now, I've been stung. Like I, I lived here 30 years and never got stung. And then one year I got stung five times. <laughs> I was being a little lax. <laughs> Evidently. <clears throat> in my discipline. Uh huh. Were they always the um, not so toxic ones? They were always the toxic ones. Oh, they were the toxic ones. Always. Oh, lucky you. Now, normally we do what have happens? a How do you treat that? Uh, we do have a shot here. The government pays for it. Uh, so you can go to the clinic. It's best within a half an hour after being stung. So your first line of defense is wash the area. That's what they teach you. Or any kind of bite or sting, you wash the area first. With soap it, and water. With soap and water. Okay. Because uh, I've, I've actually put my finger in my mouth after being stung, and then I got the poison in my mouth and in oh. my throat, and you can feel it in your teeth and your throat and everything. It's just a little bit of a strange experience. No kidding. Um, so, yeah, wash first uh-huh. and then head to the clinic. Now, I've never gotten a shot. Okay. I've always been one just to write it out. But I don't react like other people react. A lot of, a lot of people seem to have... It's a, it's a way a to thing, detoxic, right? yeah, detoxify yourself. Yeah. So, yeah, you're going to be uh, expelling, throwing up, mucus. Uh, it can be painful, but in your mind you can change it into sensation. So it's not so painful. Ice works very well. So I have some ice around. Garlic. I immediately swallow garlic. I'll crush whole garlic cloves and swallow them whole. They seem to absorb toxins and carry them out of you. I also cut garlic and put the cut garlic where I got stung. That seems to work. Uh, I was taught that, you know, the Mexicans like to put bleach on it. I was taught that that doesn't do anything. So <laughs> I know the toxic, the toxicity of bleach. So I don't mess with that stuff too much yeah uh yeah there's all kinds of uh old wives tales of how to treat it but the clinic we have a very safe uh vaccine uh, uh, shot that you can take and even pregnant women can take it and children can take it so uh it may take four or five doses depends you know, like a, a scorpion can sting you like three times 
and then three more times if you're still hanging out, and then three more times if you're still hanging out. So it depends on your dose, how quick the, your, your reaction time is to getting your hand or foot out of the way. Yeah, yeah. And they can do it fast, huh? And they can do it fast. Boom, boom, boom. And then and boom, boom, boom. Yeah. And then boom, boom, boom. Yes. Yikes. <laughs> All right, well, now that is, okay, that's a great warning. Okay, how about a word of, uh, maybe a word of advice? For, those, uh, that, for that first time visitor to uh, to Yalapa, I I like to tell people don't bring anything that you would be very unhappy about losing. You know, nice jewelry, nice rings. You don't flash things here. It's nice not to flash your money, not to flash jewelry, not to make people feel poor. So yeah, keep that stuff at home or in the safety deposit box or something like that. Yeah. So yeah, uh, be polite. Uh, be grateful. Be grateful that we do have a nice place to come and visit, that we have a lot of people with big hearts here, and they're always willing to help. Uh, but we do have our criminal elements, so just keep your... I always tell people, you don't want to walk around the streets of Vallarta drunk. You're asking for it. Yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. Um, now, you were explaining to me something. You were saying that the Lapa is not really Mexico. Right. So what do you mean by that? My understanding is that in the 1700s, uh, the king of Spain liked the people of the region so well that he gifted them the region ad infinitum. So uh, we are kind of outside of Mexican law. We can call Mexican law in to help us out with unruly people or any kind of problems we have, we can call the Mexican law in. But they don't have a right to come on their own. So we used to have a problem with that until that was straightened down. People understood that Yalapa is not Mexico. And um, and actually, actually it's a bigger region than just Yalapa. Yeah. So, yeah. It's a different different set of rules. Very interesting. Wow. Um, uh, now, the other day, I was sitting with you and having some lunch, and uh, you pulled something out of your bag and sprinkled it on your food, and I'm going, what the hell are you doing? And you said, this is salt. You said, and you pointed to the salt shaker, and you said, that salt shaker over there, that's poison right there. You shouldn't be eating that. This is what I eat. What's the deal with that? Well, I've been into, uh, let's call it the salt culture. My father was a researcher, biologist, and he researched food-grade salt. What He knew that biologically we all need salt. All of life cannot exist without the presence of salt, such as your blood is salty, your sweat is salty, every cell in your body is surrounded by a saline solution. And he knew salt was important, and he knew that this white refined salt that you find on the table could not be considered salt. In fact, there's reams of information against how white salt affects us physically. So he went on the search to find the best salt for human consumption. And he looked all over the world from the Himalayan salt to the pink Hawaiian salt to the Sahara Desert salt, all these different salts from the Black Sea salt, you name it. He went and checked out all the different kinds of salt there were. And what he discovered that there was a salt place that's been on the map for over 2,000 years. It's ingenious how it had been set up. Uh, we don't even know who started it, but it's, this is the Celtic salt from the Celtic Sea off of Brittany, France, right on the coast there. Uh-huh. Uh, and they tap in on a deep ocean current that uh, this, the water in this current is already 400 years old from its origins. And at high tide, they're able to tap in on this deep ocean current, which is very rich seawater. And then it's gone through a different uh, locks where it's got a precipitation pond, a warming pond, and then it gets played out into fields of clay where the clay absorbs heavy metals, the salt crystallizes, and the salt farmer drags the crystals to the side, piles it up, and it drains. Well, uh, my dad started his business, never ever advertising it, but we did mail-order business of selling natural hand-harvested sea salt in Uh America. 
And it was uh, doctors who got wind of it and figured it out themselves were telling their patients, this is the only kind of salt you should be using because it's got some 84 different minerals in it, which are all utilizable by the human body. They're all bioavailable. And many people have said makes all the difference in their lives using real salt as opposed to what we've been sold as salt. So what's in real salt? What's in, I mean, what's in what we've been sold as salt? Well, there's sodium chloride, and then they have to add a anti-caking agent to keep it free-flowing. And this anti-caking agent will make it turn yellow or purple. So they need anti-yellowing agents, anti-purpling agents. So they just things you really don't want in your diet, similar to gypsum. <laughs> it's an anti-caking agent. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, actually... Uh, 97% of the salt that, that is refined in the world goes for industrial purposes. The making of agricultural chemicals, the making of nuclear warheads, Morton Thiokol, maker of nuclear warheads, Morton Salt Company, uh, uh, de-icing the roads, right? Right. So, but they refine all of it because they can extract minerals out of it that they can sell at a profit, at a greater profit. Ah. So what we're left over with is this sodium chloride, which tastes like salt, tastes salty. But if you taste the real salt with all the minerals in it, and then you taste the sodium chloride, you see right away, that's a chemical. This one is something that's rich and flavorful. And people have even told me, oh, this is the sweetest salt I've ever had. <laughs> yeah. All right, so you're not, going, uh, you're not going to Europe for this. No, I, fe- I figured that... 60 years ago, I remember coming to Mexico, and every restaurant you went to, every bar you went to, had a little clay, tiny yeah. clay bowl on the table with these gray crystals in it. And that was the salt. That was con- considered the normal salt until the refineries got down here. And then everybody wanted refined salt because that made them more refined. <coughs> <laughs> So I knew that I wanted good salt, and I knew it existed here. So I went up and down the coast here. I wanted, I'm a Pacific Coast person. I figured I need Pacific Coast salt. And it took me two years before I discovered in Colima, the state of Colima, south of Jalisco, was this little community, which was a 900-year-old salt farm. And it was considered the salt for the Aztec emperor. And when I saw, they, I just happened, lucked out, while they were harvesting and they took me out to the fields and I picked up a handful of this salt and I said, ah, I found it. Nice little crystals that are beautiful and I knew it just looking at it. I knew. Dad taught me. He said, this is what to look for, right? These little pyramids, basically. And so I started buying the salt for myself and people were saying, well, we want some of that too. So it was illegal for me to sell this salt in Mexico because it didn't have the two required chemicals that you had to add to food-grade salt. One of them being flora. Um, let's start with iodine. Iodine uh, is necessary in refined salts because if you don't have iodine, you get goiter. That's a physical thing that happens on your chin. And the other one is fluoride. Now, there's enough information on fluoride to know that it's one of our favorite rat poisons. It's a neurotoxin. The first person to use fluoride on the masses was Hitler because it causes apathy in warm-blooded animals. And I lived in Los Angeles. You know, I talked to the old Jews there that came out of the concentration camps, and I told them about the fluoride, and they said, Well, you're absolutely right. There were thousands of us Jews being led to concentration camps with only a few soldiers at any time. We could have rebelled, and we didn't. We just went along. So then I found out that in our zoos, to get into the cages of dangerous animals, you give them some fluoride, and then just sit there and watch you listlessly as you clean their cage. At any moment, they could get up and attack you and kill you, but they don't because they've been fluoridated. So why is it that they put fluoride in the public water supplies? And why is it that they put fluoride in salt destined for human consumption in Mexico? (laughs) (laughs) Hmm. It's called mass medication. Where else are we being mass medicated? 
Yeah, good <laughs> right? question, right? You have been in Yalapa for a long time. You've seen a lot of strange and weird things, I'm sure, because strange and weird things happen at tourist destinations. But I'm sure that, I mean, what kind of things can you tell me about crazy stuff? Well, aside from strange sea creatures that end up washing up on the beach. Yeah. Like uh, we've seen this huge gelatinous snake-like creature. (laughs) <laughs> that you could barely pick up. Wow. We had no idea what it was, where it came from. I've seen uh, fish washed up on shore that have legs. No. Yes. Oh, my God. Oh my Didn't God. have a camera at the time, so I <laughs> co- couldn't take a picture, but I did draw it <laughs> from memory. But fish with legs. Wow. <laughs> that's, a, that's crazy. That's crazy. But the weirdest thing, well, I remember in the old days... Everybody in Yalapa was talking about the flying saucers flying in and out of the water all the time. They all talked what? about it. It was just a normal occurrence, right? To them, I'd never seen anything. But I'm open. I said, you know, it's a big world. We don't know everything. Uh, so I'm always looking, keeping my eyes open. Yeah. And one day before I was even able to speak much Spanish, I get surrounded by a bunch of kids all speaking to me 100 miles an hour, all excited about something, and I'm not, I'm not picking up what they're saying. I asked my little Mexican wife, I said, what are they talking about? Well, they said that they saw a flying saucer land on the hillside here, and some creatures came out. And I'm going, yeah, yeah, sure, right. <laughs> well, here, look, here's a piece of paper, and here's a pencil. Draw me what you saw coming out of this spaceship. Oh, well, no, don't give it to me. Give it to him. He knows how to draw. So this little kid, he takes my paper and pencil, and he draws a dome with little legs coming out the bottom. And all the other kids are like, yeah, 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 that's it. That's what we saw. That's what we saw. (laughs) And I'm going, okay, either they're pulling my leg or maybe they did see it. I don't know. What do I know? Anyways, I ended up uh, moving into a house way upriver. This is well before electricity. They didn't even have any power plants. Power plants came later as the... As thanks to tourism, the P- Mexicans got enough money they could buy a little power plant, power generator. Yeah. But this is way, way upriver. And I'm living in a little palapa house with my wife and her child. And uh, she wakes me up in the middle of the night. Now, we only live by candlelight, right? And uh, here's this palapa. Palapa is a palm frond roof, right? They're very comfortable. They let the air through, but they keep the rain out. It's all lit up as if it was daylight inside. Now, normally, somebody wakes me up, and it's all lit up in a place where there is no electricity. I'm, like, curious, where the hell is that coming from? Yeah. Well, for some reason, I just went, oh, yeah, and I went back to sleep. (laughs) And my Mexican wife swore to me that they came and they took her and put her in the spaceship. Now, here's a little community. We don't have movie theaters. We didn't have Internet. We didn't have movies. We didn't even have comic books. The comic books were those little sex comic books that they used to sell that are about four inches. (laughs) Yeah, get those at the newsstand. So they had no television. There was no radio waves that made it to Yalapa back in those days. So what did they know? These people knew nothing about flying saucers and aliens, yet here they were talking about flying saucers coming in and out of the water. The kids were coming to me and telling me that they saw something land. At night, I'm looking up the hillside where I know there's nothing there. There's no houses, nothing. And there's this incredible bright light coming out the side of the mountain. And then I have some uh, friend of mine, Mexican guy, comes to me and says, Hey, check this out. These guys, they were uh, walking up a ravine and they found these three statues, little statues that are about six, seven inches tall. And I'm looking at this little carved stone statue And it's an alien. It's not a human. I mean, it has two legs and two arms, but it's got a backpack. It's got a symbol on its front, a triangle symbol on the front. And its face is like a set of like eight globs. No mouth, no eyes that I could see. What? This is an alien. So I took pictures of it. I tried to buy it. They wouldn't sell it to me. They said they had two more. They wouldn't show them to me. Okay, well, it made me curious. Anyways, 
Years down the road, I knew of a kid, American kid, who got raised there since he was a little kid. And I said, hey, friend, I said, you who've been here for so many years and me who've heard people talk about flying saucers coming in and out of the water and experiencing weird things, what have you seen? And, of course, he says to me, are you making fun of me or what? I said, no, (laughs) dude. People talk to me about flying saucers. Now nobody's saying anything about it. He said, okay, well, I'll tell you. And he told me the same story. Tomas, I grew up here, no electricity, no movies, no TVs, no comic books, nothing. Aliens, we didn't know anything about aliens. We didn't know what that word even was. He says, but I'd get up with my buddy Johnny Belcher, half American kid, at 4 o'clock in the morning and we'd go fishing. And we would see these weird sets of lights no sound, just these weird sets of light, and they would go up the river on one side and down the river on the other side as if they're looking for something. Now, we knew helicopters, we knew airplanes. We didn't know what this was. We couldn't even imagine. Our imagination was not set up to try to imagine aliens. We just knew that there were these weird little sets of lights. (laughs) Wow. So that's all he could tell me, you know. And he said this happened several times because they'd get up early and go fishing early in the morning. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Johnny Belcher ended up going up to Alaska and he'd become a professional fisherman. And every time he comes back down for a visit to Yalapa, he's the only one that catches six to eight, ten foot fish. <laughs> <laughs> he knows how to do it. He knows how to do it. He learned. Yeah, he does. Well, that's a, that's a, that's pretty, that's a creepy story, yes. man. And then... My my Mexican wife claimed, I don't know, what do I know? I know nothing. Claimed that the aliens came multiple times to collect her and, and do experiments on her. And she said she even saw me on the slab next to her once, but I was out of it with my tongue hanging out my mouth. <laughs> I never felt anything. I never saw anything. I checked for implants. I never felt, no, no I don't know. No. So the peyote is really good. Mushrooms are really good though over in Yalapa too, I understand right? that, yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> they do have uh, psilocybin mushrooms, uh-huh. and the kids go up every year, yeah. a certain time of the year, yes, and uh, go collect them. Like, uh, like is it, what is it, ongosto, right? During August. Augusto, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, they call it ongosto. Ongosto, oh, yes, yeah. ongosto. And then September is septiembre, because there's nobody in September... Things kind of die out, yeah, so they're, they're all hungry. They're hungry, hombre. Yeah, septi hombre. <laughs> yes. Um, all right, so let's go back to your salt just for a minute. Okay. You, 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 do, have, you, you do have some salt, right? Do you sell, Always, do you yes. Sell it? Do you sell I it? sell it in Yalapa. Okay. Because I, there I sell it without the fluoride. It's a trip. It's a five-hour trip down there. And I go buy directly from the farmer before they can put any chemicals in it at the factory. And... Um, and I get to pick what I like, the ones I like. Yeah. So uh, sometimes in the warehouse, I can go to the warehouse if I can't find, and I'll go down the different piles. I, I can see, you can see the difference between salt farmers, and you can pick it up, and the, the best ones you can crush in your fingers, right? But then once they're there, then they get bulldozed into a hopper. They go into a conveyor belt where they're sprayed with these two different chemicals and bagged. So... So you get it before that all happens. I get it before that all happens, all right, yeah. All I right. say, I want you to fill... If I have to buy it from the warehouse, I, I said, here, I want you to fill my bags right here on the spot. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, sometimes I, I'm able to use my own vehicle, and other times I just take the bus. Uh-huh. They'll throw a couple hundred pounds of salt on the bus for me, and let's go. All right. Good. Okay. Wow. All right. That's, and I package it up with a little information so people know what they're getting. Uh-huh. And so where would they find it? Um, well, I, the stores all like to carry it. One of oh, the coffee do. shops, uh, restaurant coffee shops right at the pier. Okay. Uh, they're my best customers. They sell to the tourists. And some people come down and they say, well, the only thing we ever bring back from Mexico is your salt. And uh, I always tell them, I said, well, you want to make sure you got enough. Because when you run out, you're not going to want to go back to the old stuff. That's for sure. In fact, there was a, a, one little story. is I had an Italian baker here in town. And uh, I brought him a big bag of my salt once. Well, I got about a three-pound bag of salt. 
And I said, here, try this in your bread. You'll see the difference that it makes. And three weeks later, he says, I've been looking for you everywhere. I need your salt. It <laughs> makes all the difference in the world in my bread. But he was too cheap. <laughs> he didn't want to pay the price. I said, it takes me days. I got to go down there, spend the night in a hotel, go search around. I said, but I'll take you down there in your truck. You and I go down in your truck, and we'll go get a bunch of salt. And it took like three years later, he finally found me on the street again. I got to have your salt. I said, well, I happen to have 100 pounds in the back of my truck. Take it or leave it. I'll take it. <laughs> Timing's everything, yes. Tomas. And I make my own kimchi and sauerkraut, and it makes all the difference. Yeah, yeah. And in that, you know. Isn't that a key ingredient yes. in both of those things? Yes. Well, I'll be using your salt when I get home, that's for sure. I'm going to tell you that for sure. I mean, it is, I, take my word for it, folks. It is totally night and day when you taste that salt and then you taste the stuff that comes out of the shaker here. It's unbelievable. Um, before we go, is there anything that we forgot to talk about, uh, about Yalapa that you want to share I'm sure with us? there are a lot of things that we can touch on. Uh, <laughs> Uh, don't worry if you get stuck there. You can always find a room. <laughs> Good point, right? Just right. shake out the sheets. Just shake out the sheets. <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> Most of the places are pretty clean. Um, are there yeah. any ATMs? No ATMs, sorry. Okay, we no have banks, no, 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 banks ATMs. no ATMs. So it's bring pretty simple. everything with bring you. Bring the cash, yeah. bring the pay- pesos, uh, bring smaller bills. Uh, good, good point. Yeah, don't be paying for everything with a 500 peso bill. Right. It can be a little tough. Uh-huh. They'll work it out. They'll send the kid down to the store or something. Right. You know, go buy a Coke for yourself, kid. Right. Here we go. <laughs> That's how they do that. You know. But, yeah, good question. No ATMs. A lot of people ask yeah. that question. Yeah. So bring um, enough. All right. Very good. And tip. <laughs> yeah, tip. Be nice. Be nice. Right? Uh, leave a good impression so that yeah, when you come back. Especially this this year because of COVID, there's a lot. We have a lot less business. Yeah. But the people still they keep a good attitude. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Tomas, I got to tell you, um, this has been a very, very interesting time with you uh, to be able to learn all about that that place down south from us. That when we walk past the pier, that's the first thing they ask you is, you want to go to Yalapa? And you go, Yalapa? What's a Yalapa? And, <laughs> and now we all know all about it. Uh, and some of those inside stories there are pretty cool. Uh, all right. Um, well, I want to thank you. Thanks very much for, Thanks for, having me. For, for joining us and allowing me to introduce you to my audience. I my pleasure. It. My pleasure meeting you. Okay, thank you, Tomas. Tomas is really shy, by the way, about putting out his information about his salt. So uh, he will give me a few locations where you can find his product, and I'll put those in the show notes. Uh, of course, you can find it at www.portavallartotravelshow.com. And I don't know if you remember, I, you know, I've been going to Puerto Vallarta for a long, long time, but I remember in the old days when they had those little, those little salt bowls, those little salt dishes that were set up in the restaurants back in the early 80s. And that really brought back some memories. And uh, how about those flying saucers, huh? <laughs> Man, I got to spend a couple nights in Yalapa and see what where those flying saucers come from. I don't know if it has anything to do with Ricea or not, but maybe, maybe it does. Anyway, that should do it for today. Uh, next week, Stay tuned for more on-the-ground reports from Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, with travel tips, great restaurant excursion ideas, and more. But until then, remember that this is an interactive show where I depend on your questions and your suggestions about all things Puerto Vallarta. If you think of something that I should be talking about, well, please reach out to me by clicking on the Contact Us tab and sending us your message. And remember, if you're considering booking any type of tour while you're in Puerto Vallarta, you must go to vallartainfo.com. That's JR's website. Hey. Book a whale watching tour. Come on, it's whale watching season. Anyway, go to JR's website. Reserve your tour through him right from his website. Remember, this is a value for value proposition. His experience and on the ground knowledge of everything Puerto Vallarta in exchange for your making a purchase of a tour that you would do anyway. You're just doing it through him as a way of saying thank you. Thanks, JR, for being our guide. It costs no more than if you were going to use someone else, so do it, really. And when you do take one of those tours, email me about your experiences. 
Maybe you can come on board and share with others what you liked or didn't like about the tour. Again, contact me by clicking on the Contact Us tab and sending off a message. And don't forget, his maps, his DIY tours, his revitalized happy hour board and more. And I have links to all of those in the show notes. And once again, if you like this podcast, please take the time and subscribe. Give a good review if you would, wherever you happen to be listening to it. Or share with a friend. That's actually the best way to do it. That way we can get the word out to more and more people about the magic of this place, Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. Remember, I made it easy for you to do just that with each episode I create. But if you haven't been to my website, you really need to have a look there. I have the links to the places that we talk about. I have interesting pictures and more. All right there. In my blog posts and in the show notes for each episode of the show. So check them out for sure if you haven't already. All right? All right. Uh, thank you, Bob Price, from Vallarta Botanical Garden. Make sure to visit the garden next time you are in Puerto Vallarta. Do heed Bob's advice and dedicate time to helping improve the environment around where you live. Do your best to use less water. It's, it's, it's just so precious here in Puerto Vallarta. And if you do live in Vallarta, maybe join forces with neighbors and do something about the trash in your neck of the woods. Every little bit helps. And thank you, Tomas. Thank you, Tomas the Salt Man from Hollywood, California, and Yalapa. Uh, check out the show notes for some pictures of the salt mines and a few pictures of Tomas uh, and a few pictures that Tomas actually sent with me, sent me to share with you. You can find them all over at www.puertovallartotravelshow.com. Hey, and thanks to all of you for listening all the way through this episode of the Puerto Vallarta Travel Show. This is Barry Kessler signing off with a wish for you to slow down, be kind, and live the Vallarta lifestyle. No se vemos, amigos. Yeah, yeah.